Okay, this is a it made it for Paramount. It's a Paramount home video. And the back of the box reads as such. A gothic thriller which grips you with its combination of horror, romance, and the supernatural. It is World War II in German-occupied Romania. Nazi soldiers have been sent to garrison a mysterious fortress, but a nightmarish discovery is soon made. The keep was not built to keep anything out. The massive structure was, in fact, built to keep something in. Dot, dot, dot. Scott Glenn portrays the stranger who alone must battle the supernatural forces whose evil power is dwelling within. Ian McKellen is the medieval historian Kuza, dragged to the keep to unravel the mystery behind its gruesome killings. Alberta Watson stars as Kuza's devoted daughter, Eva, who falls in love with the handsome heroic stranger, Scott Glenn. And that's the back of the box. Paramount Home Video. Paramount Home Video. Almost all serious film fans out there, as well as film critics. When Michael Mann came out with Thief, with James Caan, he blew our minds. It, Completely. We, it was like, roll over, John Carpenter, tell Walter Hill the news. Uh, you know, it was uh, a new guy out there uh, yeah. on the crime film scene who wrote great, gritty dialogue. He had a wonderful visual sense. And made an existential film out of it. It's an existential crime film. Yes, exactly. It, it elevates the form. It does elevate the form. And one of the things about Thief is it was the only one of the like crime films that came out within like a three-year period that like it had the same resonance of a, of a crime novel. But also, right from the beginning was that he was a, a, a stylist. There was, a, there, there was a, a, an orchestrator involved. There was a director involved. Yeah, and it would be a lie to say that Thief wasn't like a massive influence on me whenever I was thinking about Killing Zoe. When I was designing all of the bank drilling stuff, I was mm-hmm. literally both... I wouldn't say standing on the shoulders, more uh, cowering in the shadow mm-hmm. of Michael Mann. Well, Michael Mann point. actually affected a lot of directors. I mean, everyone heard about after the fact that he just kept a water truck uh, on his set all the time to just to constantly wet down streets. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that became the thing for directors to do. Thief looks fantastic. Let's get a water truck and let's yeah. just wet down these night streets and, yeah. th- and throw lights on them. And like when you're saying it affected your work, I mean, uh, th- there's lines in Thief that affected my life. Insofar as I have always lived my life trying to be like James Caan, insofar as I am Joe Boss of my own life. <laughs> yeah, you are that guy. I am Joe Boss, and I am Joe Boss of my own life. You are that guy who <laughs> went and, you know, you are the professional thief who carried around in his pocket a little collage of a family and children in a house okay. with a picket fence. Okay, you literally are saying the worst part about thief, all right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm relating it to you and your, yeah, okay, your, yeah. how, you, how you identify. Maybe you don't even know why you identify as uh-huh. much as you do. Yeah, okay, there's only difference, though, is I would enjoy that postcard. The only reason the character has that postcard is to just loot, is to say, fuck it, and throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Here's all the life's good yeah. things. Okay, oh. now I'm, fuck that, I'm gonna kill everybody. Well, that's just it. That's I, the, uh, this is not for me. <laughs> that is the Buddhist existentialism inside of Thief, in which is, you. he lets go of it all in order to advance. Yes. Well, it's well. I uh, I wouldn't put it quite like that. Before we get too lost into the thief, <laughs> I would put it more about the idea that um, he was untouchable because he was untouchable. Yeah. The minute that he fell in love, the minute he had something they could take from him, the minute they could put the bite on him, he had to get rid of the kid. Suffice yeah. it to say, it was such a powerful movie that it yeah. affected all of us in such a big way that immediately Michael Mann was like the man. He was the man. Absolutely, he was the man. Okay. okay, so based on, like, the back of the box, I'm already in. Like, I'm in 100%. It reminds me of Castle Wolfenstein. I'm, like, a Castle Wolfenstein fan even back then. Mm-hmm. But it's like you've got a big keep. You've well, got yeah, Nazis. You've well, got- what's going on? Well, what's going on for the audience is, is the fact that uh, just, like, small village in Romania, mm-hmm. all of a sudden, the Nazis show up. Yeah, the Carpathian Mountains. Yeah. It, and Alex Thompson shoots the movie. And I, I almost yeah, have yeah. to say right away because the the, the two the – two, Powerful elements at the top of this movie are Alex Thompson, mm. who is one of my favorite DPs, and Tangerine Dream. And with that amazing, mm. amazing long lens first shot of those trucks. Oh, absolutely. Look, look, and I, with that incredible score by well, Tangerine look, Dream. I'll, I'm going to mention uh, in a bit 
when I first saw the movie. Uh, I hadn't seen it since I first saw it at the theaters. As time has gone on, pretty much the only thing I remembered about it was the beginning. Yeah. Because the beginning was so impressive and it was so ambitious. And also, I think there also is just even a small point as far as me and Roger are concerned that we love William Freakin Sorcerer so much yeah. and nobody at that time was talking about Sorcerer. So to see a movie rip off Sorcerer. Yeah. Uh, to set the tone of the film yeah. using Sorcerer. It I'm did, in. Yeah, it, did, it, it, it didn't matter that they're ripping it off. The fact that like Michael Mann knows to rip Sorcerer off <laughs> yeah. when other people obviously don't. All yeah. right. That all, all of a sudden put it in this other category. And then immediately you're, you're introduced to the next uh, Praetorian guard of Michael Mann, which is John Box mm-hmm. and his beautiful set. For this Carpathian village in mm-hmm. in in the mountains, which I believe was done in a in a quarry or something mm-hmm. in, in Scotland or Wales or somewhere, but it's an absolutely beautiful mm-hmm. village. It's so beautiful. I completely it inspired me to when I wrote this screenplay, unproduced screenplay, mm-hmm. ninety nine days of Empire oh, yeah, yeah. script. Uh-huh. It was that set uh, that like you know inspired me. Like I saw that and I was like. I had never seen anything like it depicted so beautifully in a movie. So in the keep, the thing is the Nazis come into uh, the Carpathian mountains in Romania and take over this village. They, hey, we need to do some work here. We're taking, there's this keep over here. We're going to make that our home base and just everybody just stay the fuck out of yeah, our and Everybody way. wants to be at the Russian front, like for the big glory battle. Like, oh, we should be at the front. We should be at the front. I'm, which, I mean, I can't imagine any soldier actually realistically thinking I want to go to. Well, but okay, but their, <laughs> their whole reason for saying that is like. But, but the Russian front sent is, here. The Russian front is just starting. So like, oh, it's just a matter of moments when we, yeah. once we bring Russia to its knee. And that's part of their, yeah. like, their, Victory shall their be joke. Ours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should be wrapping this up, you know, within weeks. Yeah, but it, none of them really want to be there on this detail. Just like, you yeah, know, yeah. looking at this old, you know, right. pile of stones. And so you, when you get into the keep, you see that it's uh, seems like hundreds or at least a hundred silver crosses that are kind of yeah, built they're actually around. nickel. They're described as nickel, nickel yeah. initially. And so uh, two German soldiers left there during the night go, hey, I, this is this is silver. Let's steal this shit. Mm-hmm. So they start trying to pry off one of the 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 silver things and that. Whatever has been kept in the keep, it, it, it unleashes it. Yeah. And it's, it's in fact kind of drawing them to it. It's like it's yeah, yeah. revealing this nickel, which has been presented as nickel, mm-hmm. as silver. And they're like, it's silver. Yeah. 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 This, it is yeah. silver. And they start trying to pull it out. And in doing so, they end up pulling out kind of a, mm-hmm. a capstone of some kind that yeah, yeah. reveals this vast, vast, vast underground hellish cavern. Yes. Then that ends up killing those two soldiers. And now, you know, This thing is just kind of killing random German soldiers almost every night. And so Jürgen Prochnow, who's in in charge of uh, the Germans, first they think it's uh, resistance people fighting amongst uh, the Romanians. And so they're threatening him with this and they're threatening him with that. And he's supposedly kind of the good Nazi, you know, sort of like somebody who would have been like in the Navy or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. He's sort of like, well, More the Luftwaffe kind yeah, of guy. Yeah, sort of a, yeah. a traditional... Oh, I mean, he's, he's I, cynical about the... Frankly, to tell you the truth, one of the better things about the movie is while they're kind of casting him as the good Nazi, he's not that good. He's all, you know, he's all crowing. Well, you he know, still believes they're going to win. Yeah, exactly. He's all crowing <laughs> about, mas- oh... We'll, we're still going to be the masters of the world. Russia will be nothing. I mean, <laughs> when they usually cast the good Nazi, he's not really down with the cause. No, no, Prok now is no, down with the cause. <laughs> all right, uh, but while he's down with the cause... He's smart enough to realize, okay, look, this, despite all appearances, it's obviously not these Romanians with, who got the balls to be killing our soldiers when they were saying, it. we will kill everybody in this village unless you turn over the saboteur. And like, they would have turned them over at some point, you know, so he knows that that's not the case. But anyway, enough of this shit has happened that now all of a sudden the Gestapo shows up. And they're going to get to the bottom. And we get a little bit of extra juice suddenly. The promise of that opening Absolutely. comes back. And then leading the Gestapo is 
the best performance in the entire movie. Absolutely. And that's Gabriel Byrne. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Leading the Gestapo, and he is... Yes, and I'm not even a Gabriel Byrne fan, No, me neither. Se. Me neither, really. But he's kind of... He was born to play that part. It, it's He's got, like, he looks right in the haircut. He's got, like, a face that, I mean, Gabriel Byrne is... I don't even, look, here's the thing about that. I don't even know if he's that great in the part. He's just what the movie needs at that time. Well, he's a perfect he's villain a, he at is, that time. He is the villain of the movie. Yes, and he the looks... The monster is not the villain. He is the villain. And he looks great. Uh, yeah, no, the the, the, you know, the monster is, is strangely a, 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 a B villain, all right, yeah. by comparison. Uh, and he looks great in his Gestapo uniform. That's all the bad guy side, which is the interesting part of the movie. Yeah. The completely uninteresting part of the movie is all the good guy stuff, which uh, most unconvincingly deals with uh, uh, Scott Glenn's magical character because apparently he's angel character yeah he's an angel basically or he's like or the warrior that time has has deemed the good one to fight against this evil and, warrior if the evil thing in the keep is ever released and, and time is a good thing to deem him that because his name is glocken which yeah, yeah, in yeah. german and you know implies a kind of clock like regularity whatever this is that's being held this 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 horrible evil that's been held in the keep for like hundreds of years. Once it's been released, even though we don't quite know what it is, all of a sudden, a hundred miles away, Scott Glenn just materializes, yeah. you know, as this kind of wakes up. Yeah. But, but no, it's almost like, like, but like, like there's a, there's a hotel room and he's, he's just all of a sudden there. And so he got dressed as a sailor. Yeah. So he's got his, so he's got with his journey. He's got his journey yeah, with the box. <laughs> Don't even go into the box. It's not worth talking. It about. is worth talking about. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to talk I, about I, I that fucking I, box. I will let you talk about <laughs> it. The box is a cool thing <laughs> until it just holds a pole. <laughs> it's like you could have just gotten one of those in the Carpathian Village. But now look, don't have I to am not a fan box. of the Scott Glenn stuff, but the Scott Glenn stuff is good by comparison to the Ian McKellen. Well, and he is actually highly effective looking. Like he looks angelic. His eyes, and I think they must have contacts in him or something, but he has a kind of ethereal I think he quality. looks weird. I think that the, those well, eyes make him look weird. Angels are weird. Makes him look weird. Angels you know? are weird looking. The, what, what I don't like is whenever they try to up the ante, because it's enough that Scott Glenn is there and he looks at maybe a woman or something and she looks at him and is, you know, taken. But uh, instead, they do these like they're constantly trying to push the like this rotoscope effect over his eyes. Like, wow, you don't need to do that. He looks weird enough. Yeah, no, I know. You, <laughs> you don't need to push the effect. No, he looks like fucking Submariner. And, yeah. uh, and effects <laughs> effects are one of the problems with this movie. And it mm -hmm. may not be the fault of anybody mm -hmm. because uh, Wally Weavers, the VFX uh, supervisor in the film, died right after production mm -hmm. was complete. And apparently nobody knew how to complete what had been planned. So. There was mm -hmm. a lot of reshooting, mm -hmm. I'm told. And mm -hmm. then uh, Alex Thompson moved on to do other things. And so many of the reshoots were done by a different DP, which is why the interiors look so bleak and dark mm -hmm. and really hard to see things. Alex Thompson's one of my favorite DPs. And for the movie to uh, suddenly get murky and weirdly well, lit I, 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 with I, odd lighting sources that... Well, know, <laughs> odd light, well, the whole movie... the. Whole, yeah, well, that, you're bringing it up as if odd lighting sources <laughs> develop in the last 45 minutes. The whole film is set up with like there's no structure or where this light is coming from. Not only that, they even have that one light that they put every actor to stand in. Yeah. <laughs> stand in this light. Stand okay. in the way of it. We're going to be Ever, backlit. Jorgen Prock now sits in it. OK, then when uh, <laughs> Gabriel Byrne shows up, he sits in it and has a scene almost as if just to sit in the light. Yeah, well, he has to find its light. But where the film, I think, really goes bad is all the stuff that deals with the villagers. Because the minute that Robert Protsky, who plays the, the priest in the village, the minute he shows up like looking orthodox like... Orthodox priest, like yeah, a Catholic priest. Looking like Leo McCarran, all right, with a phony yep. brown wig and a phony brown beard. Whatever reality you had about the Nazis coming into the village and taking it over is destroyed and then then they start talking and you don't buy the way the villagers speak or the way they talk well and they, they don't really ever design a life in that village either no you buy the nazis you just don't buy the you know yeah, you, like 
No, I mean, literally, Gabriel Byrne is so convincing and so commanding in his performance. Well, frankly, and then but you that's, have all these. It's it's actually one of the big problems with a lot of uh, World War II movies is when they they have these little villages because they spent time on the tanks and doing this and doing that, but they don't spend time on those villages. So every place just seems like they're taking over Brigadoon. Yeah, <laughs> and we're just like crappy extras yeah. hanging around. So the thing is, in Dachau, they have a medieval. Um, professor played by Ian McKellen and his daughter, who are the ones that know what's going on as far as about the keep is concerned. So when the Gestapo is demanding we need to know things, he goes, well, the two people that that know about the keep and are, are the world experts, you have them in Dachau. If you send them over here, they can straighten us out. So they send them over there. And um, by a teleportation device. Yes. They're there like that. Yeah. And Ian McKellen gives what has to be the worst performance of his career. It's almost like he's doing Jimmy Stewart. It's a, and then it, the makeup isn't helping. It's the wig or what the hair piece isn't helping. Well, I mean, well, frankly, I mean, who he looks like and sounds like is he sounds like the old gray doctor in the wheelchair that's in a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> Right. I yeah. mean, even the wig looks yeah. dissimilar. The, the, he's this doddering old guy and he, and he's using this horrible voice. I mean, one, it's 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 an American accent that's horrible, but it's a horrible old man American Well, it's voice. kind of talking a little bit like this. Well, like, that sounds better than what he... Well, that's the, so kind of like a Jimmy Stewart. No, it, it literally... <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like a bad community theater production. And he looks... I mean, it, even like the wig, all his... The look looks like a bad community theater production. So basically, Ian McKellen starts investigating and then the this powerful being that has been let loose presents itself to Ian McKellen. Molasar. And you know, this whole keep was built 200 years ago or however, a thousand years ago, however long it was built to keep this thing from getting out of hell and, 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 and ruling the world. <laughs> that sounds like Castle Wolfenstein. I'm in. Yeah. And so then Ian McKellen ha- ends, On that alone. ends up having this uh, of conversation with the creature and he's telling the creature about the Nazis out there, what he's doing. And they're like, hey, how dare they do this to my people? I will destroy them. But first you have to let me get out of here. But then I, then I, I will destroy them. And you, you were speaking as the monster. Yeah, right yeah, then. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because it was more like, you know, oh, what have they done with my people? Yeah. Like it was much uh, more like, uh, you sounded a little bit like Ian McClellan. Yeah, probably. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I saw this film, I took a bunch of my friends from like college. Mm-hmm. To, yeah, we're going to see Michael Mann. It's totally cool. And then we're seeing it and it's it turns into like, it starts off well enough. And then it starts getting a little muddled and confused. And by the time those guys, those two German soldiers are trying to pry the silver cross out of it. No, that's not when it's good. <laughs> well, it's still good. But like at this point, suddenly the music goes so over the top and suddenly he's shooting everything in such a highly stylized way that it removes you from any kind of reality that has been established beforehand. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with this movie is the reality of the film is a little clumsy. It, it, it takes big jumps in time. The, the creature is designed by Enki Bilal, the comic book artist, the Uh French comic book artist. I've also heard that Michael Mann was changing his mind about what the thing should look like. Well, it looks like, it looks like a cross between Bella and Basket Case and that weird uh, Jim Henson and the Muppets used to be on Saturday Night Live. They had that one big stone <laughs> statue that would talk every once in a while. Rah, rah, rah. You know, it looks like that, yeah, too. Exactly. <laughs> he looks like a fucking Muppet. Well, and so, <laughs> like, you know, suffice it to say, everything comes together. And then we're kind of introduced to the logic of the movie. And this is where I really started breaking it down because it's just like it just felt like they were making it up as they went along at this point, which I kind of think they might have been. Mm-hmm. He, there's this amulet that's holding the monster in the cave and the, the monster needs a human servant, which is going to be the doctor. Yeah. And because they're sort of a confederate, because the monster or the, the creature, uh, Molasar, mm-hmm. is, you know, supposedly some kind of. If you let me out of here, ancient, I will wipe out the Nazis. Yeah, ancient yeah. Judaic uh, demon of some kind. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, no, it's the part that works and what damns the part that doesn't work is the fact that the monster actually is a golem. Well, it, you know, he that, gets himself into the golem. Which, which, is which a, makes it sound like the Ian McKellen character should be more of a rabbi than the scientist guy. Well, and, and it, uh, it, it, that would make a lot more sense because <laughs> like when you go back to Rabbi Lowe, who uh, was the one with the original golem yeah. and pulling the Shem out of the mouth because his, and because I had a problem originally with the, uh, um, I, I'm just going to say the ending of the movie, so 
fast forward if you don't want to hear it. But, uh, you know, Ian McClellan has a change of heart. And I just didn't buy his change of heart. You know, the golem is used to basically protect, uh, you know, the Jews from the anti-Semitism mm-hmm. of the Holy Roman Empire at that time. Of, yeah. Uh, emperor whoever who was well, uh, running big, everything and he actually when he sees the golem growing mm-hmm. and getting bigger and bigger and bigger he realizes it will grow so big that it will overwhelm the world mm-hmm. if he if he doesn't you know Put stop, stop it. it and he pulls the shem out of its mouth which is the uh, magical mm-hmm. name of god written on a mm-hmm. cloth or paper and uh, and that ceases it and it turns to dust and so i think what he's trying to do is he's trying to kind of mirror this choice but it's done in a very clumsy way, and, a, and frankly, and I love Michael Mann, and done and done in that bad action movie way where everything's being said while yeah. wind machines are blowing and special yeah. effects are going, and the and, music and, is know. so hot that you can't hear anything that's yeah, going everyone's on. Everyone's talking at the it has to scream over the wind machines. It might as well be it's a cacophony. It might as well be National Treasure. And I love Michael <laughs> Mann. I think he's one of the last great users of cinematic vocabulary. I, I love like the I think his work in The Insider and like Manhunter. Like you know how much I love yeah. a lot of his work. Um, this was crushing because I, mean, I went, I took up all my friends to, to go see this movie. even say the name, the insider in the same sentence as this movie just shows the dichotomy between, I mean, it's almost seems sacrilegious to bring up a real movie like the insider in yeah. comparison to the keep. Michael Mann ends this movie with like, at, at a point when you're just like, what the fuck am I looking at? Boom, a film by Michael Mann, and he just doubles down on ownership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, he does movie. that, yeah. He proudly takes ownership of yeah. what he's just done. And when his name appears, it drew guffaws from us. It, <laughs> we it, laughed. It, it, we did, but I thought about it later. And there's something about owning your embarrassment, owning it as much as you, and you may not have experienced embarrassment <laughs> with, your, <laughs> with your work. I have. Uh-huh. I've experienced, you know, a uh, a particularly tough production Mm -hmm. where everything went wrong. You know, I mean, a few things went right, but most everything was just a disaster. (laughs) And it's just like you come out of it and you're like, what the fuck? And at a certain point. And that movie was Pulp Fiction. No, (laughs) No, it was it was actually it was actually a TV pilot I did called Mr. Stitch. And it was such a painful experience for me at the end. And after I had made it, I, I was so it was my monster. Uh-huh. I was embarrassed of it. It was like it hit. It wasn't at all anything even close to what I wanted it to be. And like all I could see was the terrible production. And it hurt so bad uh, that it even existed. And then several years later, I, I bumped into another filmmaker friend of mine who's like uh, Christoph Gans, the guy mm-hmm. who did uh, yeah. Brotherhood of the Wolf. And he did a little Lovecraft movie at one point. And he said, oh, it's an embarrassment. You have to own it. You have to treasure it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so ever since then, I've just treasured it. It's my child. It's a little bit of a weirdo. I am maybe the only person who loves it, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I do love it. And, uh, and there's something about Michael Mann just accepting ownership because we know that this movie was a troubled production. When we got through watching it, I just said, all right, that was a fucking fiasco. Yeah, it, and it was. It's a f- fiasco. But... It wasn't entertaining, but what was fascinating about it is to see a guy who has become one of cinema's great stylists trying to be a great stylist before he knows his shit. Now, he was able to pull it off with, if you ask me, Michael Mann only works when he's dealing with the 20th century. (laughs) His style is very well suited for our modern times. And it's and it's and I think there's a particularly just something about Michael Mann doing crime stories. I think that I, I, there's something a little lost when he's not doing a crime story, with the exception of the insider, which they try to make as much like a crime story as they possibly can. I mean, there's even apparently there's assassins after uh, uh, it's insinuated that there's assassins after Russell Crowe at some moment. So uh, I absolutely love the cinematic language that he's using inside of the insider. And that's actually one of the reasons I he's almost like Douglas Sirk in that movie. Mm-hmm. There's a moment where Al Pacino is I mean, I'm sorry, um, uh, Russell, Russell Crowe Crow is looking out at the sea mm-hmm. and he's trying to decide what to do with his future. And there's <laughs> looking this, out of the sea. 
Okay, the Michael Mad it's shot. It's a classic right. Michael yeah, Mad shot. The wall, yeah, the the wall of glass behind you that has a, a beach yeah. going on. And there is a simple. <laughs> Doesn't is, matter if you're a regular cop, you can afford a house on the beach with a wall <laughs> of glass. Well, it's he's standing on the beach, and there's a single line of the horizon with blue and blue. Yeah, and it's just that, and you see him kind of in the extreme foreground. You're looking a little bit behind his ear, looking at it. Then suddenly. Al Pacino approaches him from behind. He, hey, you're ready to go. And he turns to look at Al Pacino, who's behind him. And the camera pans with him. And it pans to see what's just to his left, which is all these police cars and mm-hmm. like and, and like flashing lights. And he's supposed to go in and yeah, yeah. You know, to the courtroom or whatever he's supposed to do. And it's abject chaos. Mm-hmm. And it's a, be- it's a beautiful moment. And when he finally cuts away, before we know, what is he going to do? Is he going to like testify or not testify? He, he cuts back to this wide shot and it shows... Russell Crowe on one side of the frame and Al Pacino on the other and this palm tree just cutting the frame in half, Mm -hmm. showing their division. Michael Mann, at this point in his career, is commanding of cinematic vocabulary. He's using a Mm -hmm. grammar and a vernacular. He's one of my very favorite stylists. And that that is why this ultimately ends up being interesting because... Frankly, it's interesting to see a great cinema stylist before he was that good. He's not in control of his style. He's constantly lost. And when he's lost, he goes to slow motion. When he's lost, he throws in more smoke. Yeah. When he's lost, he cranks up the music. But you know what we can thank The Keep for? Because of the perhaps experience, perhaps uh, reception of The Keep, Mm -hmm. he retreated into television and did Miami Vice. Yeah. Which absolutely altered culture in a massive way. (laughs) Like it defined rather culture. It did. Okay, speaking of which, Band of the Hand yeah. is far better than The Keep. <laughs> yeah, you were a huge... I remember when Band of the Hand was in the store, you were pushing that film like it was nobody's business. Well, I, I, I like the opening credits, okay? The opening yeah. credits with the Bob Dylan and, song and was even, pretty good. I think Cat Squad. Didn't we also have that in... Uh, yeah, well, well, Cat Squad is way better yeah. than The Keep. <laughs> like, those were Cat like Squad a couple of the ones that you were good. like... Cat Squad is one of Freakin's best things yeah. of the 80s. The yeah. first one. You love Cat Squad. I happen to have in my possession here the December 1983 issue of Film Comment, which has a uh, interview with Michael Mann talking about The Keep, written by Harlan Kennedy. Now, I actually remember reading this when it came out. This is the part that stayed in my mind. And when I read it again, it was the part that jumped out at me again as well. It's not particularly about The Keep, but the interviewer asked him, how important to you is the use of the widescreen? Hmm. And Michael Mann replies, very. It's important to me for two reasons. One, because this is an expressionistic movie that intends to sweep its audience away, be very big, to have them transport themselves into this dream reality so they're in those landscapes. They're with the characters. You can't sweep people away in 185 and mono. Also, I'm not just interested in passive filmmaking, in a film that's precious and small, and where it's up to the audience to bring themselves to the movie. I want to bombard an audience, a very active, aggressive type of seduction. I want to manipulate an audience's feelings for the same reason that composers write symphonies. And that could never be done in 185. Yeah, well, (laughs) well, that can can be done in 185. It can be done in 133 if you want to. I'm just saying. Nevertheless, I I appreciate this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read that last part again. I want to manipulate an audience's feelings for the same reasons that composers write symphonies. Uh, The guy follows it up. Well, what are your feelings about ultimately seeing this big screen film on television and video cassette with the sides cropped off? Good question. Are you pushing your compositions towards middle of the screen? No. <laughs> Whatever happens to it when it goes on television or video, that's the breaks. I can't do anything about that, but I can do everything about the cinema experience, which for me is obviously primary. So the shots are composed for the big screen and the film is designed to be effective for theatrical audiences. And if it does that job, then it's going to do well on TV. Well, and I remember that. I remember that. Like, it was yesterday, reading that in 1983. What's amazing is hearing a guy who's so powerful with the small screen yeah. at his young age. Well, it's his kind of sophomore effort well, well, doing be, a uh, He'll a be embracing the small screen, like, in about a year from now, yeah. all right? It's about, it's, about, it's about a year and a half away from Miami Vice, <laughs> yeah, <he's still, laughs> which is where he really makes his name. He's still full of the pretension of... Yeah. Uh, nah, yeah, that's, not, that's, that's right on. That's not pretension. That's, 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 uh, that's, a, that's a mission statement. 
the one last thing I got to say about the keeping the lid, I want to say about it. Okay. But maybe one of the weird things that I think there's a connection to my work. For whatever reason, I didn't see the keep when it like when it first first opened. I saw it, I think, at the World Cinema. And naturally, I thought the whole first 15 minutes when the Nazis take over the, the village and all the sorcerer referencing and the tangerine dream score and grills of trucks and tires splashing through mud in the yeah. rain and Nazis sitting behind the texture of the film. Nazis sitting behind dirty windshields. It was fucking amazing. That, the incredible, right? was, the incredible long lens tilt that, yeah. that occurs at the beginning oh, yeah, and, then, and then lands perfectly at those trucks that are, uh, that are like miles that away. tilt shot is amazing. It's, it's um, just simply stunning. So you have all that, but then it has the scene when the when you know the 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 evil incarnate uh, is having his big scene with Ian McKellen, and then he has that moment. Well, you know the well the Nazis they're they're exterminating the Jews. They are. <laughs> Who dares do this to my people? I will destroy them. And then Ian like, yes, that's exactly what we want. Well, that was exciting. Yeah. I couldn't wait for that. That was to happen. the interesting dynamic of the movie. And then naturally, that never happens. Yeah. Of course it never happens. That's a that's a real movie. That yeah. would be fantastic. That never happens. But the effect of that, and then just a little movie you you make in your mind of what that would be, yeah. uh, was not lost on me for Inglorious Bastards. There yeah. is this from the moment I saw that scene, a little seed was put in me that someday I should make a movie that delivers on that scene. Wow. And I did. <laughs> hey, did you know that Mayfair Games made a board game out of this? No, and, I didn't. And I found that out and I thought you should know that because we should try to track that down. Yes, because I, I, I collect board games that have to do with movies and TV shows. I would. OK, despite <laughs> everything I said here, I would happily play a, a keep board game. In fact, I dare say it'll definitely be more entertaining than the movie. <laughs> We're going to find out. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, the keep was a fiasco. Yeah. I wonder how present day audiences would feel about it. Let's find well, out. Well, let's find out. 